This week on the agenda, we're in Athens for an exclusive interview with the governor of the Bank of Greece, Yanis Donaras. For 13 years, Greece faced a debt crisis and financial stagnation. Three international bailout programmes and a global pandemic later, and the economy is steadily growing. The cost of living still soars and unemployment remains high. But growth in Greece is outpacing most Eurozone countries. So what's behind the economic revival? And what has Greece learned from the economic crisis? We're in Athens to talk to the governor of the Bank of Greece, Yanis Donaras. Well, thank you very much for having us here in Athens, where we're in the midst of a heat wave. But it's not slowing you down, is it? It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here, even under these conditions, actually. But in terms of where the economy is going, how things are moving, the economy when it's is moving, this hot... Uh, the, the economy is moving fast, yes. Uh, so uh, it, there's no doubt that Greece uh, has been a success story in the economy, uh, coming back from, from the cold uh, during the crisis. But now it's growing fast. It's reducing its public debt to GDP ratio very quickly. Uh, it is embarked upon a number of, uh, of structural reforms. So, all in all, a success story. To what but, extent... But with a lot of suffering before, I, I, I should point out to that. To what extent would you say that Greece's economic revival is still a work in progress? Of course it is a work in progress. We have, just to tell you the big picture, I think uh, we have solved the big problems, uh, the first order problems, which is debt refinancing, uh, recapitalization of Greek banks during the crisis, staying in the euro, don't forget that. Because many people had doubts that Greece would stay in the euro, both in 2012 and 2015. Now, these are problems of the past. Uh, with a lot of restructuring, a lot of consolidation, um, we reduced the gigantic twin deficits, the public sector deficit, the current account deficit. We recapitalized banks. Uh, we uh, have made interventions to the social security system, uh, to the tax system. So these, are, these have been the first order problems that have been solved. Now we have a number of, I would say, second order problems. Important, of course, they are, like still bureaucracy in the public sector, delays in justice, the triangle of knowledge, education, connection of education with the uh, production um, with the uh, development model of the country. So th these are, I would say, second order problems, but th th these are the ones that we are trying to solve now. Is high unemployment and the soaring cost of living, are, are those second order problems? Um, unemployment is falling very quickly. Actually now, Greece uh, has vacancies. Uh, we have lack of hands, uh, so there is excess demand for labor now. Uh, of course, uh, there is a paradox. The numbers show unemployment going to um, as high as 10.5%, but also um, there, there are vacancies. That shows that still certain distortions in the labor market and uh, mismatch, mismatch between skills. Uh, so the skills we want, uh, they do not exist. So perhaps we need uh, to, to bring uh, labor force from abroad. That's, that's the questions we uh, have to uh, answer now. And that's a conversation that many Eurozone economies are having, isn't it? I wonder, is, is Greece's economy changing fast enough? It is changing fast enough, yes, yes. Uh, it has become much more extrovert. It has become much more competitive. Um, it, has, it, it has resolved many, many problems that it, it had in the past, but still there are uh, problems remaining. Still tax evasion, delays in justice. Um, I would say uh, the, the, the labor market uh, has a number of problems in tourism, in agriculture, in, agriculture, in construction. Uh, there is lack of hands. Um, so there, there are many vacancies there. You, you said before Greece very nearly left the euro. That was a serious conversation. I reported on it. You lived through it. Um, it was very, very close. But now there seems to be a turnaround. And Greece seems to be um, very much the darling of the eurozone. 
with, with growth that's outpacing many of the other Eurozone economies. So where, where has that come from? Has it been a financial support from your peers? Has it been the government's direction or, or something else? I think it was a combination of, of mainly two things. Uh, the first is that uh, the Greek people um, bear uh, a, a huge restructuring. Um, we increased uh, taxes, we reduced expenditure, we reduced pensions, because there is unfortunately no other way that in the short run you can solve a public sector, de a gigantic public sector deficit problem. So there was a lot of austerity and suffering, I'm afraid. But the, there wasn't any other way uh, in such a small period to solve the, the problem. And also refinancing of the, of the Greek banking system, um, creating new, new institutions, uh, a treasury between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance, uh, for instance, was uh, the independent authority for the tax revenues, in my view, was a very important reform. Um, so that was on our part. Now, our, our partners contributed to this by refinancing very generously our public debt. Now, um, the Greek public debt uh, has been fixed. In, uh, it's, uh, the, the, the duration is more, the average duration, the remaining duration is more than 20 years. The average effective interest rate on public debt is 1.3%, one of the lowest in Europe. It is in official hands, so that, that's why I said that, that was the most important problem, first of the problem that has been solved now. Of course now uh, our, our consideration is to have a, a primary surplus of 2% of GDP so that this large public debt is falling steadily uh, for a number of years. Um, but also we are trying to have a high growth rate, and we, we actually do. Now we have one of the highest uh, gro gro growth rates in Europe. It, it is very important that the, what we call it, sorry to, to use a technical term, the snowball effect is helping us a lot. It was a problem in the, what is the snowball effect? The snowball effect determines to a large extent public finances, and it is the difference between the nominal growth rate and the average interest rate on public debt. In the past, during the crisis, that was, that was negative, which means um, nominal growth was very small, uh, the average interest rate on public debt was very large, so that, that, that was dragging us down. Now, it, it, it is the other way around. The nominal growth rate is much higher than the average interest rate on public debt, and that picks us up. So to, to put it in uh, non-technical terms. There's something that's niggling me, though. You talk about austerity and the suffering as, as was, as, as in the past. But there are still people who are struggling to put food on the table. The prices of basics are, have gone sky high. I, I know high inflation and the rising cost of living is something that isn't unique to Greece. But how are you tackling that? As you know, inflation in Europe is a common problem. Um, it is mostly a supply side shock. It came out of the pandemia. Then we had the war in Ukraine, which created an energy shortage in the beginning. And uh, Europe, as you know, is a very large net energy importer. It's not like the United States, uh, which is uh, an energy exporter. In Europe, we import a lot of energy. Uh, and then uh, we had a food crisis. So there was another supply side shock. Under these circumstances, uh, bringing inflation down uh, and at the same time um, having a, a soft landing is not an easy thing at all. But I think in the ECB we have done a good job. Uh, we have used monetary policy in a very careful manner. Don't listen to all these critics that they say that we were late to raise interest rates. This is not correct. In my view, we have followed a very moderate uh, monetary policy tightening. Now it, it is accelerating and we have managed to, to have much lower inflation. I re remind to you that last October inflation was more than 10%. Now it's half of it. Uh, and also we have soft landing. We don't have this huge recession that many people had, had, had predicted. Of course, we, we we're not growing fast in Europe. It's almost zero, or we expect a 0.9% growth this year, which, given the circumstances, 
is not about, uh, about the achievement. It's interesting you say inflation has come down. So we're still celebrating, are we? <laughs> Five point something per percent. So it, it, it's, it's still expensive to live it, right now. It is expensive, yes, of course. And uh, food, food prices are still very high, uh, but uh, it is. I mean, we live in a huge uncertainty in the world. I mean, after the pandemic, uh, after the, um, the war in Ukraine, geopolitical conflicts, that means that uh, um, the world now um, faces m much more uncertainty than before. So uh, economic policy um, takes place uh, under much more difficult conditions than before, and we have to be very careful. That, that's why both governments, banks, companies, they want to create buffers uh, for the next day. I want to talk to you more about the Eurozone in a moment, but let, let's stick with, with Greece, because I, 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 I sense that you're very optimistic uh, about what's happening and how things are changing. Um, you said in March that Greece was months away from an investment grade rating after 12 years in, in the, the junk bond wilderness. So do you stand by that? Oh, and, yes, and, yes. So, okay, so I, when's it going to happen? No, yes. Uh, first of all, now we have a... a uh, a government with a full majority in the parliament. We had elections a few days ago. It's a, it's a pro-European government. It's a, it's a reformist one. So uh, it, it is doing the right thing. I mean, it's not easy for a central banker to concede that, but I can, first, many, many of these people who are my colleagues in, in previous governments, and uh, I know they are dedicated um, uh, to uh, fiscal sustainability. They are dedicated to reform. The Prime Minister um, uh, has announced a very ambitious reform program in the Parliament a few days ago. So, all in all, I'm optimistic, yes. Since 2019, the government has been very pro-business. Foreign direct investment ha has grown steeply. But Greece still has the highest debt load in the Eurozone. I know you're talking about bringing it down, but it's still, the economy is still yes. much smaller um, than it was. So. What reforms are needed now? I would say two things. First of all, we should continue on being uh, fiscally very careful. We need uh, to increase our primary surplus. It's, about, it's going to be 1% of GDP this year to 2% next year. And stay there, stay the cyclically adjust the terms. We need a 2% primary surplus for, for a number of years in order to bring this uh, large public debt to GDP ratio, as you said, down, but it's falling down. I mean, it's, it's not, uh, Greece in terms of public debt is not an outlier. Uh, it, it might be an outlier in terms of numbers, but in, in terms of servicing the debt, which is what, what matters, it's not an outlier anymore. And th this is important. This is number one. No, number two, the reforms that I, I, I have talked about before, delays in justice. Um, labor market distortions, skills mismatch, um, connecting more universities uh, with the economy, I would say. These are, these, these are the big challenges. Let's talk about the green economy. What role do you see Greece playing there? On the green economy? Well, um, as you know, one of the perhaps omissions we have made in Europe is that it's not sufficient to invest in photovoltaic or in, uh, um, in windmills. We also need two more things. Grid to connect you know, the various parts within Greece, for example, the mainland with the islands, Greece with other countries of Europe, um, and Africa, perhaps, Greece with uh, other countries in Africa. Uh, and also we need batteries, we need storage capacity. So a lot of investment has to take place in grid and in storage capacity now, because green energy without these two things, it's, uh, it's not good, it's no good. I mean, it's because it is wasted. As you know, unless we can store uh, electricity and unle or unless we can disperse electricity through, through the grid, it will be wasted. So those are things you say the Greek economy needs. Well, yes. What are you doing about it? We invest a lot. 
I mean, we, it's true that uh, uh, the um, European Union provides Greece and other uh, European Union countries with a lot of investment money, uh, especially after the pandemic, uh, but also Greece invests a lot in, this, in these areas. And in terms of drawing that investment, wh where are you looking? Where, where's that green money going to come from? Uh, both uh, the private sector and, and the public sector. It's public investment, partly financed by the European Union, but also private investment. So it's a combination of private investment and public investment. Still to come here on the agenda from Athens, more from my interview with the governor of the Bank of Greece, including Belt and Road and the importance of China to Greece's economic revival. We are all connected across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the Agenda from Athens. Let's hear more now from my interview with the Governor of the Bank of Greece, Yanis Stranaris. I want to go back to inflation. I, I don't want you to think it's a bugbear of mine, but it is what everybody's talking about, what everybody's feeling. And even when the numbers come down, prices of everyday things don't seem to be um, doing that. You know, how do you think that high inflation has dampened the, the economic outlook, not, not just in Greece, but beyond? Yes, yes. Of course, as you know, inflation reduces the disposable income because wages have not adjusted uh, as much as um, in, uh, as much as prices have adjusted. So uh, there is, we uh, we are witnessing a real wage drop in the in the previous years. Now there, there's some catching up. We want this catching up to be uh, moderate, so because we don't want to to create a spiral between wages and prices. We want two things, actually. We want wages to increase no more um, than the sum of inflation and productivity. And we want companies, especially in certain sectors, to bring down their, their profit margins, which have increased a lot. Which in sectors? In the previous two, two years. Energy, food, but in, in many other sectors as well. We, we have, for the first time in many years, um, prices have outpaced wages to a very large extent. And also they have outpaced as costs, which means that profit margins have, have gone up. Okay, I hear arguments that we need to, to create buffers for the future, but this is stagflationary. If this continues, it will be fatal. It will create stagflation. It will create inflation through a wage price spiral and reduction of production and GDP, which is, will not be good for societies. What would you say is particularly different about this inflationary cycle? Compared to the previous ones, uh, I think it, it, it is mostly a supply side inflation. Uh, it came through a series of supply side shocks. That's how it started. In America, it was both demand and supply. In, in America, it was, I would say, if I can say an ad hoc number, it was 60%, uh, or let's say it was 50-50. In Europe, it was 80% supply, 20% demand. That's the, in Europe, for instance, um, expenditure, domestic expenditure, is still not at the pre-pandemic level in Europe. In America, it's higher. Okay, so how to fix it? Unfortunately, monetary policy is not enough uh, to tackle inflation, which comes from the supply side, uh, and at the same time, uh, have a soft landing and financial stability. So, to say it in a, in a different way, monetary policy is one instrument, but we need more instruments. We need macroprudential policy, which means that we have to look after the health of banks. We need fiscal policy, 
I mean, we cannot, um, let's say, increase interest rates and at the same time, uh, governments expand fiscally. So uh, we need a helping hand from fiscal policy as well. And also structural policy. We, we want reforms like the, the ones I described for Greece. Uh, we want energy policy. Uh, I think the European Commission now has done serious steps on energy policy. So it's a combination of policies that are needed to tackle supply-side inflation if we want to have at the same time financial stability and uh, uh, a soft landing in the economy. But in terms of using the, the, the tool of, of raising interest rates to bring down inflation, do, 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 you, do you think it's working? It is working. Uh, it is working not as, as good uh, as compared to a case where it would, uh, it would have been a demand-led inflation. But even in a supply-side inflation, um, monetary policy has helped to contain inflationary expectations. Expectations now are very close to, to uh, inflation expectations are very close to 2%. I think to a large extent this is because of monetary policy. And also, it has, so far, it has prevented a, a spiral between uh, wages and prices. You, you sit on the, the European Central Bank Governing Council. I mean, how do you really feel about the direction that interest rates have been moving in? So far, so good, I think. I agree with what we have done, and uh, we have done it careful steps. And that's why we have managed to bring down inflation and also we have a soft landing. So and also financial stability. We don't have episode, bank episodes in Europe. Well, Greece was, of course, the, the first European country to sign up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it's going to mark its 10th anniversary um, this year. Now, the port of Piraeus is just a few miles from, from where we are right now. That was the first European stop on the maritime Silk Road. How has Chinese investment changed the Greek economy? Well, I think actually this Costco investment in Piraeus turned out to be a good investment. It has turned Piraeus around. It has made it a very competitive uh, port. So it's a successful investment, all in all. And I think um, it has much more to, to offer. I think it, it should connect uh, the port uh, with uh, the railway system uh, to create lo uh, logistic centers. So there's still a long way to go. But it's a, it's a successful investment, I can say. And in terms of Chinese investment more, more generally in Greece, how yes, important we, has it been? We have, uh, I mean, China, of course, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a partner, it's a commercial partner of Greece. We import, I mean, about uh, as a percentage of total imports, Chinese imports of goods in Greece are about 8%. The same, we, ex we, we export not goods to, to China, but we export services especially maritime services, it's again it's about 8% 8, 8 of the total export of services go, go to China. So it's a, China is an important partner for Greece. But also, uh, there's some direct investment coming from China and Hong Kong, that's China, of course, uh, to Greece. Uh, it's not only Costco, but also some real estate development coming from China. You've mentioned Greece is very open, um, open for business and um, exporting services. I mean, how important would you say China is uh, as a, a market for Greek businesses? And, and how can you, as the country's chief banker, help them tap into that and other global markets? Well, um, I think China is a, is a very large country, of course, very distant uh, uh, from Greece. But still, I think uh, there, there are opportunities to increase uh, exports, Greek exports to China, uh, and services, but also goods, I think. That's, uh, olive oil is, uh, is one example. It's, uh, so I think there's still some way to go. And in, in terms of investment, too, I think. That's, uh, we, we welcome investment, provided uh, rules are being um, uh, Rules are being obeyed, uh, international rules, so uh, we, we are very open to investment from, from China. We've talked about the Greek economy, we've talked about where it sits in the Eurozone um, and, and prospects for, for growth there, but the backdrop is complex, isn't it? Economic fragmentation, slowing growth in general, high inflation. So what's your take on prospects for 2023? For Greece, according to our, to our forecast, we are quite optimistic. 
2.2% growth uh, this year, 3% next year, 2.7% uh, the year after. So much higher than the European average, so what, which means real convergence. Of course, the important thing is to have real convergence, but without macroeconomic imbalances. And that's why we're very careful on our fiscal, um, fiscal policy. Now, uh, for Europe, uh, the, main, the main task is to, to bring inflation down uh, to 2% as soon as, as soon as possible. Within, we'll hit very close to 2% uh, in, into 2025. It's, uh, and, and, and inflation is, is falling. We are, we are pleased to see inflation falling. Uh, now, of course, the question is to have soft landing, to avoid a recession in Europe, and to have also financial stability, that is, healthy banks. The world is complicated, They're full of uncertainty. Um, just to tell you one example, the so-called advanced countries, they contributed half to the world growth before the crisis. Now this has fallen to less than uh, one-fifth. So that, that shows. So mo most of growth now com com comes from Asia, from Asian economies, China, India, and other uh, Asian economies. So these are still, they, they have become um, uh, tigers again. Let's put the growth numbers and the forecast to the side for, for a moment and just, let's just think about those risks to financial stability that, 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 you, that you fear, that you, that you see out there. For the rest of the year, what might be the main roadblocks to returning to growth and shaking off the, the spectre of global recession? Well, uh, that's why I said before that uh, we should not continue uh, rising interest rates uh, because a combination of still high inflation, uh, low growth, uncertainty, and rising interest rates uh, might, something, uh, might cause something to break. So we, we don't want that. that that's why uh, we are now on, on thin edge. Uh, we have to be very careful uh, with monetary policy, with fiscal policy, all policies should be available uh, to achieve the target of bringing inflation down, okay, but with soft landing and financial stability. This is the important thing. Complicated because, because of uncertainty worldwide. But you like a bit of complication. You, you, you've worked um, all around the world. Yes. So if there was one economy that you could get your hands on now, which one would it be? <laughs> that, that's it. <laughs> it's a good question. I think, okay, uh, let me... Uh, turn the question and say that I, I believe very much in cooperation uh, between economies, especially between the giants, uh, especially between China and, uh, and the United States. I don't believe that in the economy the game is a, a zero-sum one. I believe that the game in the economy, again, is a win-win. So I believe in cooperative policies uh, and uh, It's never uh, first best to have trade restrictions. I believe in open trade between economies. Uh, you can achieve whatever you want with other means, but not with tariffs. I think tariffs and trade restrictions create welfare problems uh, in all economies. So it's never first, first best. So if I, I'd like to answer your, your question uh, by saying, of course, Greece is a small economy, so I, I hope that uh, what I'm saying doesn't sound uh, very arrogant, but uh, if I can advise both in the US and China and other big economies, is be cooperative. Uh, I think cooperation is better than, than, than conflict. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us, I think. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Governor. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming soon on The Agenda, sustainable tourism. How possible is it to be an environmentally and socially responsible traveller? But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in Athens, goodbye.